is CBS News in New York. It's Saturday, October 29th. Your reporter, Robert Trout. Hello. The pilot of a Cuban airliner today defected and landed a whole plane load of passengers in Key West after a wild airborne gun battle with guards of the Castro government. One person, reportedly one of the guards, was killed, the pilot himself was wounded, and a third person, a child, was wounded too in the gunfight aboard. The plane, with 34 persons aboard, reportedly was transporting political prisoners from Havana to the Isle of Pines, which is just south of the main island of Cuba. Uh, shortly after the takeoff, the pilot, with his gun in his hand, emerged from the cockpit and announced he was taking the plane to Key West. The Cuban army guards aboard immediately opened fire, but the pilot, although wounded, is said to have disarmed them after an exchange of shots there in the air. Customs and Immigration Service officials in Key West have confirmed that this Cuban plane has landed, but they give us no further information, not yet. More news in a moment after this message. Government-inspired anxiety in Cuba this weekend seems to be touching a new peak of anger, perhaps even fear, as the Cuban people are goaded more and more into believing that invasion by United States armed forces is very near now. Fidel Castro's controlled press today labeled as imperialist provocation the announcement by Washington that we have now landed 1,450 Marines at our Guantanamo Cuba naval base from the carrier Boxer, there for a weekend period of rest and relaxation. But the Havana regime had nothing to say about Washington's call for an investigation by the Organization of American States of the increasing communist arms shipments to Castro. The latest evidence of worsen worsening relations with Cuba was the departure from Havana of United States Ambassador Philip Fronsel, who said goodbye yesterday to friends and colleagues and then went aboard an automobile ferry for the short trip to West Palm Beach in Florida. Cheers from Dockside Castro supporters accompanied the farewells of Americans who remained behind in Havana. Ambassador Bonsall's recall to Washington appears to be more than a simple recall. Although di diplomatic relations with Havana do go on, the ambassador took 40 trunks full of his belongings with him, and he is said to have no plan to return to the island of Cuba in the near future. Well, Vice President Nixon today stopped all negotiations with Senator John Kennedy, which apparently ends all the possibility of a fifth television meeting between the two candidates. In a telegram to Kennedy assistants, Mr. Fred Scribner, Jr., who is the television advisor to the Vice President, said, there can be no further negotiations unless Senator Kennedy apologizes to Mr. Nixon. The Republican aide, Mr. Scribner, said Senator Kennedy had charged Mr. Nixon with bad faith in the talks about the fifth television appearance and that the Kennedy negotiators had delivered an ultimatum for agreement as part of a clever scheme to end negotiations. Those are the Republican charges. Throughout the discussion of a possible fifth television meeting, the networks had made it clear that they would make television time available if the candidates could agree on their appearance. With election day 10 days off now, both the candidates turned their attention to the big city suburbs. Senator Kennedy toured outlying districts of Philadelphia, heading through Republican Delaware County in Pennsylvania, the Democratic candidate charging that the Republicans believe the people are gullible and incompetent and are unwilling to trust Americans with the facts about the nation's economy and the facts about its prestige overseas. Vice President Nixon, moving through the suburbs of Chicago today, announced his pleasure with last night's remarks by President Eisenhower. Candidate Nixon said the president's talk was one of the greatest political speeches of recent years, and he was said to be exhilarated by the presidential praise for the Republican ticket. That speech by President Eisenhower was delivered in Philadelphia. I have lived a fairly long and full life, so I tend to think of this nation in terms of my children's and grandchildren's problems. In thinking of their future, I am profoundly concerned by some statements in this campaign that have had worldwide circulation and have cruelly distorted the image of America. These statements demonstrate an amazing ir irresponsibility. They demand from me, they demand from me emphatic correction. This week, this week, Pravda, one of Moscow's propaganda newspapers, reproduced speeches 
by some American politicians. You know who they are. <laughs> bewailing alleged weaknesses in our country. The Soviet leaders are gleefully quoting from these same speeches in their effort to prove that our influence with other governments of the world is shrinking. My friends, too many people are talking carelessly and ignorantly about America's standing as if our republic were in a popularity contest. Catholic citizens of Puerto Rico today are under threat of excommunication from the church if they disobey the directives of their bishops not to vote for Governor Luis Munoz Marin and his party in next month's election for governor. That's not definite, but the possibility was announced by the chancellor of one diocese. Puerto Rico has three. And in the second church letter this weekend, the bishops warned again that they consider the governor's ruling popular Democratic Party to be anti-Christian. Tomorrow's Reformation Sunday on the calendar of most Protestant churches, the anniversary of Martin Luther's 16th century protest that began the split away from the Roman Catholic Church. Many Protestant churches here in the United States usually hold services commemorating the Reformation as a sacred event. Tomorrow, a number of Protestant groups, mostly fundamentalists, are expected to add to the religious service a warning against the election of a Catholic president of the United States. Here in New York, CBS News correspondent Harry Reasoner asked a leading Protestant theologian about the political aspects of tomorrow's Reformation Sunday. He questioned Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr of the Union Theological Seminary. As a Christian and a, and a Protestant, would, could you characterize this, uh, the action of the fundamentalists to consider it reprehensible? Or? I would consider it re reprehensible in this sense if it is based upon... Uh, honest apprehensions, and I can understand the historical roots of that. I wouldn't uh, criticize it. But when it spreads hate, I would regard it as reprehensible. Reprehens I think from leaving politics out religiously, what uh, fills me with uh, deep disturbance is that uh, the hate has actually been spread. I had a letter from a nice Catholic woman who said, I have many Catholic, uh, many Protestant friends, and I dread to meet them after Reformation Sunday because I know that so many bad things will have been said about my faith. Now, I, I almost wept with a letter like that because uh, if religion doesn't produce charity, uh, it is a salt that has lost its savor to use the biblical phrase. More news in a moment after this message. Little noticed by many Americans in the noise and fury of the close of the election campaign, the events in France seem to be moving towards some kind of climax. The Paris police are hunting an Algerian terrorist who shot and killed a policeman and an innocent bystander, a pedestrian, and they fear that shoot street shootings will get worse as the Algerian tension increases. A report today from Tunisia in North Africa, next to Algeria, says that communist military officers may appear there next week to help and advise the Algerian rebel forces. And French writers today have formulated plans for a massive Paris rally on our election day, which is November 8th, has nothing to do with that, of course. That rally to be the rightest answer to the rising sentiment to end the war in Algeria by slicing it away from mainland France. This is such a rally, a leftist rally at the Mutuality Meeting Hall just off Boulevard Saint-Germain. A Peace in Algeria rally, it's called, and an audience of 3,000 persons listen to student, labor, and teacher speakers demand an end to the Algerian war. The police will come back such sentiment, but the rightists are planning their rally next month. The police expected trouble, all right, as a result of this meeting. Thousands of students who couldn't squeeze into the hall milled around in the streets outside. The police sent thousands of their security forces to surround the hall and to try to keep the leftists and the rightists separated. But what the police couldn't prevent was the infiltration of a dozen rightists into the hall and a resultant smoke bomb that dropped in hopes of breaking up the meeting. <laughs>
the police just couldn't keep the opposing groups apart. This was the start of the riot in Paris that resulted in the arrest of 485 persons. And the police estimate that the leftists outnumbered the rightists four to one. The rightists fought leftists. The police fought both sides with clubs and weighted capes. This, the police fear, may be only the start of a new series of violent outbreaks because the anniversary of the Algerian fighting is on Tuesday, a likely time for such outbursts. Well, CBS News correspondent David Schoengrun, my colleague and friend who surveys the scene from Paris, has just arrived here in this country to help cover the election a week from next Tuesday. He's here in our New York News studio, and he'll give us a view of what we may expect in Paris and in Algeria in just a moment after this message. For the first time since his return to power in May of 1958, the regime of General de Gaulle is in serious trouble under pressure from criticism on the left and threats of violence from the right. The country's intellectuals, the elite of the nation, are impatient with de Gaulle's failure to take more vigorous steps to discipline the army and to bring peace to Algeria. I heard a lot about this in a strong statement from one of the nation's leading cartoonists, Tim, whom I visited in his Paris studio the other day. You have been indicted for cartoons like this, for insulting the army. You've signed a manifesto in which you've said you think that young people have the right not to answer a draft call. That's a very strong position you've taken, and I wonder what impels you, a loyal citizen, to take such an attitude? Well, they are two things. First is that a uh, young civilian being drafted for war in Algeria has to obey to army heads. They don't obey to the civilian government of France, of the Republican government of France, so they may legally disobey orders which are not given by their government. The other is that this same war in Algeria gives an extraordinary power to the army head. They became practically a political party. And they are ruining our liberty in France. For example, me as a cartoonist, I am tried, I'm sued by a military trial by a military uh, court for a cartoon, which is a civilian, journalistic, expression way of uh, communicating with other civilian people. The point that Tim just made is of the greatest importance in measuring the extent to which the military power is infiltrating the regime of General de Gaulle. French intellectuals charge that this is a violation of democratic principles and that and the practices of a republic to take civilians and try them by a court-martial. They say this is a more immediate danger than a military coup d'etat. France, according to this argument, could become a semi-fascist military state without a coup if the army's growing control of civil affairs and its challenge to General de Gaulle are not halted and eliminated. The army is getting bolder and bolder. General Raoul Senon, now on the inactive military list, is very active politically. This week, at a news conference in Paris, this former commander-in-chief of the forces in Algeria, who led the coup that brought de Gaulle back to power, turned upon de Gaulle. He denounced his policy of self-determination for Algeria and announced that he and his friends would fight to keep Algeria free. Porter fièrement le drapeau de la patrie et montrer au monde que l'Algérie, c'est la France. Salon's friends, the power behind the generals of the army, are the professional troops, spearheaded by the paratroopers, a potential Praetorian guard for an apprentice military dictator. 
These are the men who were standing by to jump on France if the politicians of the Fourth Republic had dared to resist their coup. But they did not jump two years ago because the frightened politicians resigned and then voted de Gaulle into office. And now de Gaulle has to cope with the problem of these soldiers who have sworn to keep Algeria French. This army is an immovable object for de Gaulle, who was caught in one of the classic riddles of mankind. What happens when an irresistible force comes against an immovable object? The irresistible force is the nationalist revolution of the Algerian people, who've been fighting for six years a desperate and a cruel war of guerrilla action and of terrorism. Their leaders are men who once were proud to call themselves French citizens. One of them, Ferhat Abbas, once said, I have searched history, and I have plumbed my heart, and I find no Algerian nation. But now, this man is the president of a rebellious Algerian government. His history has now caught up with Fehat Abbas, and this man's heart no longer belongs to France. Next week, on November 1st, the Algerian war will enter its seventh year. Militarily, the rebel forces have been contained by the French army, but the revolution has grown stronger politically and diplomatically. It is no longer isolated. Fehad Abbas has just returned from a trip to China and Russia, where he received firm promises of help for his revolution. If anyone is becoming weaker and more isolated, it is not Fehad Abbas, it is Charles de Gaulle, who finds everyone turning away from him, his friends as well as his adversaries. De Gaulle antagonized Khrushchev earlier this year. He insulted the Chinese by calling them yellow hordes. He's angered Americans by his go-it-alone nuclear policies and his criticism of the basic principles of NATO. De Gaulle is fighting almost alone in a moment of crisis. He is a man for whom the bells toll. the strange case of a hermit who is only happy in a crowd. He cannot stand people taken one by one, but he loves the people all together as a symbol of the spirit of France. De Gaulle goes to the people in the way that a driver takes a racing car to the pits to get its batteries recharged. And this week, De Gaulle got his recharge from the applause of these crowds. One can say of De Gaulle, as once one said of Roosevelt, that everyone is against him except the people. With this difference, that Franklin Roosevelt was in tune with the people. He was close to them and identified with them. De Gaulle towers above these people like a high priest intoning a litany. The litany is the national anthem of France. It is De Gaulle's own personal theme song, and he likes nothing better than to lead the people to sing his song with them. correspondent David Schoenbrunn, who is here for the election night broadcasting a week from next Tuesday, gave us that report here in New York on France. More news in a moment after this message. The latest incident in the Congo, a British newspaper man who works for the Associated Press called for United Nations help early this morning when a whole squad of Congolese soldiers tried to break into his Leopoldville hotel room. In reply to the correspondent's call, a UN armed squad rushed to the rescue, and the Congolese soldiers, shouting as usual, went down to the hotel lobby, where at last report they were camping and waiting. Colonel Mobutu, trying to hold some kind of Congo government together and keep out former Premier Lumumba, announced earlier this week that military action would be taken against correspondent Goldsmith if he didn't leave the Congo at once. The announcement made at a news conference, which Mobutu said he would hold at a certain roadblock in the camp of the paratroopers. But the United Nations jeep that was leading the motorcade of newsmen to the conference ran right through the roadblock into a fence of barbed wire, and Colonel Mobutu supervised the rescue operation. It took a lot of work to free the car. The colonel, at odds with the UN, plainly concerned that the barbs may pierce a UN tire, so he postpones the conference. And the colonel tries to help. 
then goes back to watching. Behind the lead jeep, the newsmen await the start of the conference the colonel has called. Finally, the men get the job done. Colonel Mobutu finds he soiled his hands while trying to get the car free of the wire, so he walks off to the side of the road and wipes his hands on the nearest patch of grass. The crisis is over. The news conference can begin. The business of the news conference is the charge that the colonel makes against the Associated Press correspondent. Mobutu tells the reporters that reporter Goldsmith has sent distorted dispatches. He is not among the newsmen at this conference, though. But he later said he has written the same things that the other reporters on the scene have reported. Acts of violence by Congolese army soldiers and United Nations charges that Colonel Mobutu is not acting the way the UN would like him to act. Mobutu, in turn, charges that the United Nations favors pro-communist Lumumba. And the colonel was praised this past week by Congo President Kasabubu, who says that the Congolese soldiers in their raids in the native quarter of Leopoldville actually prevented a civil war. Today it's reported that Congolese soldiers in another city, Stanleyville, considered to be something of a stronghold of Lumumba, have arrested a number of political leaders acting after Lumumba's former vice premier arrived in Stanleyville. Well, about the only ray of cheer reported from the Congo is provided by a United States citizen, none other than Louis Armstrong, the best man with a trumpet in any continent, dark or light. So successful is the current visit of the man known as Sachmo that today Moscow Radio attacks Louis Armstrong, saying he's been sent to the Congo to distract the Congolese from their crisis. Sachmo, who could distract almost anybody from anything, has not replied to Moscow yet, but he might say, those Kremlin squares just don't dig it, daddy. This week, TBS news cameras focused on events in West Germany, Tokyo, and Long Island. Let's take a look. Amazon common defense purpose, because space is so scarce in West Germany, the new Panzer and Parachute units will be allowed to train in France. This is the vanguard of what will eventually be 35,000 troops a year on a rotation basis. The first contingents, which total 2,400 men, are rolling across the border. A camp near Sison, which is near Rance, one of the two training areas which German contingents will use. A final note in a moment after this message. Ready to go on, Mr. K. Uh, coming. Gee, just think. My first television show. <laughs> I wonder what people are saying about it. He's a frightfully amusing chap, Bob. I simply love the way he wiggles his ears. You know? He's curiously comical. Ah! Oh, he's terribly amusing. He's droll. They tell me that he is almost as funny as Maurice Chevalier. <laughs> you know what they're doing right now, those crazy Americans? You know that right now, in the middle of election, everybody is stopping to look Danny Kay on television? Absolutely crazy they are. <laughs> Nikita Chke, please tell me, what is election? Hmm. I really hope you'll be able to watch on Sunday night, October 30th, for our first television show. Try to join us if you can. Uh, it might be fun, and I'd, I'd love seeing you all. A couple of election items that have nothing to do with the issues. A lady from Kentucky, Mrs. John Brannan, who now lives in Illinois, wrote to the Kentucky authorities that she needs another absentee ballot because hers blew away in the wind. Reply from the state of Kentucky, no, only one ballot to a customer. In Boston, a gentleman gathering votes for the Republican candidate for Massachusetts Secretary of State handed a passerby a leaflet and said, your vote for Secretary of State is very important. The man who'd been handed the pamphlet said, I hope so, I'm the Democratic candidate for the office. In England, a new law goes into the books today. Nobody's allowed to bring soap into a municipal swimming pool. The other bathers have been complaining about the suds. And in South Carolina, Sergeant Fred Davis of the Charleston Base Safety Squadron, giving a lecture on the danger of leaving a garden rake lying with the prongs up on the floor, accidentally stepped on the rake. Sergeant Davis, for the next few days, will be giving his safety lectures with a black eye. 
Here's the Saturday headline. 1,400 United States Marines today landed at our Guantanamo Cuba Naval Base for what Washington says is a weekend of rest. And that's the news. This program has been produced under the supervision and control of CBS News. Ted Pearson speaking.